Well, thank you everybody for attending this talk um, about using OpenStack Rift for extreme data durability. I'm here together with Florent Flamand. I'll let him introduce himself. So hi, my name is Florent Flamand. Um, I'm, uh, I'm working at CloudWatt on, on OpenStack. Uh, basically, I'm, I'm, in tr I'm trying to have OpenStack working uh, at CloudWatt. And uh, here are my details if you want to contact me. Yeah, my name is Christian Schweder. I'm a developer working at Innovance Red Hat, um, mostly working on Swift um, automation, testing, and developer tools. I'm also one of the Swift core developers, so there's a very good chance to meet me on IRC channel from Swift, OpenStack Swift, and of course using uh, email address and my Twitter handle. So before talking about uh, durability and availability in Swift, uh, let's first have a look, a small look uh, into the architecture in Swift. Um, Swift is an object storage, that means it's not in block storage, it's not a file system. Most of the time, or well, all of the time you're accessing your data in Swift is a URL where you just send a put command or try to get data with a get command. And these commands or these operations are ex executed against a proxy node. This is one part of a Swift cluster, the proxy node. This is the part your users are talking to. And in the back end, you have some storage nodes that actually um, store your data on disks. Now, if you, want, if you start with a very small cluster, let's uh, say only two nodes, and you configure Swift to have three replicas of every object that you store in Swift, these objects land on different disks in your cluster and on different storage nodes. And in, th in this case, on three different disks and two storage nodes. But well, that's not the recommended way to operate a Swift cluster, so the documentation says let's start at least with five different storage nodes, um, so let's add a few more nodes. If you add more nodes, and if you have more nodes than replicas configured, your data ends up on different storage nodes. So Swift always tries to move the rep each replica inside your Swift cluster as far as possible from each other. So if you have more disks than replicas configured, it ends up on different disks. If you have more storage nodes than replicas, it ends up on different storage nodes. Now, there are some, well, I would call it failure domains in your data center. So for example, your network uplink, power boots, or network switches, something like that. So you might want to ensure that each of the each copy of your objects end up in different areas in your data center. And to ensure this, there is another concept. And this is called the zones. So for example, you can group different storage nodes into different zones. Let's say you have three racks with a bunch of uh, storage servers in each rack. You can ensure that when you put an object into Swift, all the three replicas end up in, s in different racks in your Swift cluster. Now, what you also have to keep in mind is that each time you put an object into Swift, Swift only confirms a success if the object is written at least, well, a quorum times, and in case of three replicas, it means it only confirms the operation if you have two successful write operations. Now, Maybe you, or hopefully, you, you have a really large Swift cluster, and you also want to ensure that your data, or a part of your data, lands up in a different data center. And you can extend this concept and add more regions, or group a bunch of servers and zones into regions. And in this case, where we have two thirds of the storage nodes in one region and one third of the storage nodes in another region, you end up with data, or with two copies in your one data center, and a third copy in your second data center. And of course, you're not limited to two regions. You can have five regions, or three regions, for example, one in the United States, maybe, one in Europe, and another one in Asia. But Swift needs to know where to place the data, where to read the data, where to write to. And this is done with a ring, with a hash ring. And Florent will tell us a little bit more about the ring. OK, thanks, Christian. So um, the ring is, uh, is something Swift developers are always talking about, because uh, basically it's one of the main components in Swift. It's a, it's a map of the data you have in your cluster. 
Um, so basically, you have uh, one file per type of data in Swift. For instance, you have one file for containers, one for accounts, and one for objects. And, uh, and these files map uh, each copy of each data on a physical device through a mechanism that we call partitions. So what's a partition? A partition is a number that is computed from an object's name, including the, uh, the container and the account's name. Actually, it's what we call the full path of, of the object. So the, the, <coughs> the partition number is computed from a fraction of, of the hash, the MD5 hash, that is computed of, of this, uh, on this full path. And the number of bits considered and interpreted by Swift depends on, on your cluster. So it's a setting that you do du during the creation of the ring. And uh, this setting is quite important because once uh, you, you specified the number of bits that will be interpreted, you cannot update this number. So there are recommendations in uh, the, the Swift operation guide uh, on OpenStack uh, documentation that will help you to, to, have, uh, to choose the best number. So basically, in the ring file, there are three, three elements. There is uh, one uh, big table which, uh, which associates each partition for and, uh, and each copy to a device ID. Then you have a second table, which is a devices table that associates each device ID to and, and provides all the information that a Swift node requires in order to reach this device. And then you have the number of bits to consider in, in, the, hash, in, the, in the hash of the object. So there is a little tool that, uh, that I linked there that is called SwiftSense that allows you to, to visualize the ring. So that's the common representation that we, we do, although uh, I would rather uh, represent uh, this structure as a, as a table. So here is a little example to make it clear what a ring is. So uh, this is an example of, um, of uh, eight partitions uh, three replicas cluster. So on the left, top left, you have the, the two dimensions table that uh, allows to find the device ID of an object. For instance, if you have an object whose partition number is two, you select column number two. And if you want to know where the replica number one is, which is a copy number one, you go to the intersection of, of the row number two and uh, uh, sorry row number one and column number two. I've got the, the device ID three, so this is the device where the object is stored, at least the, the first replica. So you go to the devices table, and here you see that this device um, is located on, on the on the host, which IP address is 192.168.0.11. And the port to reach this service is 6000, and the, the device name is SDC1. And finally, the, you have the last information in, in the ring file is a bit count, uh, the, the, so the number of bits to consider in the, in the hash of the object, which is a 3 in that case, because you have 8 partitions, which is 2 to the power 3. So, still about the ring, the, there is a new feature in, in a Swift, which, uh, which uh, landed in Swift 2.0. It's uh, what we call storage policies. So it allows operators to, to, to let users choose between different storage strategies. And uh, this, is use, this is made possible with the use of a se several set of files, uh, se several ring files, actually. So one set of ring files per storage strategy. For instance, you can have a, a basic storage policy where the where each object we have two copies stored on, on spinning disks in, in a single data center. Then you can have a strong storage policy with uh, three copies of each object in three different data centers. And, and then you can have, uh, for instance, uh, the fast uh, policy where all data is stored on SSD devices. So I let Christian talk about uh, availability and durability. OK, thanks very much, Florian. You're welcome. So availability and durability, what do I mean with this? So with durability, I actually mean that you don't lose an object. With availability, I mean that uh, you're able to access that object. 
Now, for example, if you power off your storage nodes, your objects are still there, but they are not accessible. So let's first have a look at durability in, uh, inside Swift. And what you see in your data center uh, during a given year is a lot of disk failures. So from my experience and from others, you most likely see two to five percent of disk failures per given year, which is quite a lot and uh, doesn't match exactly the number of uh, mean time between failures that are given by hard disk vendors, but it's actually what we see um, in operations. You also have a very good chance to get a read error during the operations of a Swift cluster because your disk is not able to recover from, from a corrupted object, for example, on your disk. And the vendors specify most likely a probability of 10 to the power of minus 15 per bit read. And if you make the calculation, that means if you read tw about 12 terabytes of data, you will have, li at, have at least uh, one corruption during read operations. So let's assume you have three replicas of an object. Actually, when you have two to five percent probability that you lose one of these disks, the object is stored on, then you have a degraded cluster, or for at least for this object. You only have two replicas left. Now, Swift has some built-in mechanisms to recover from that. One is a, one is a replicators that uh, try to, well, not try, but they are recovering from the rem remaining two objects or replicas and uh, recreate the third replica in this case. The other one is um, object auditors, which um, go over your objects and see if there's a bit read error. And in case the object is corrupted, um, they're moving these objects aside and the replicators later on will recover the third replica. Now, if you have only two replicas left, there's also a chance that you get another disk failure. This the probability here is now much smaller because you're not longer looking into one year, for example, but only, let's say, 10 hours or 20 hours. This is a time until the normally the rep replication um, recreated the third copy. And if you're really unlucky, um, then you lose another disk where your object is stored on. And finally, if you continue with that, and if you don't, for example, if you don't uh, let the replicators run, you might end up with some data loss. So if you only take this, these numbers into account and uh, calculate the probability to lose an object, you get a durability in the range of 10 to 11 nines within a given year for one object um, with three replicas. So if you're interested in the numbers and the calculation itself, um, there's a small web site. Okay, you can see it. Um, looks like this, you can put some numbers into that and you get a number and you get a graph. I will come to that in a few seconds again. This is public and um, you see the link here. So, as I said, it's important to keep the number or the, the hours between, um, or the hours for a replication quite low. So, um, normally, what, what are you doing when you have a disk failure? Let's assume you have only six disks. And on the six disks, you have five partitions, for example. And the disk on the right side, it's marked red with the colorful dots, is now going to fail, or is already fa has already failed. Now, normally you just replace the disk, right? And after you replace the disk, you need to replicate the now missing partitions back to this disk. Now, if you have a disk sized, let's say five terabytes or six terabytes, or maybe even more in the future, this will take a long time. It will take, well, if you're lucky, it will be done maybe in 20 hours. Um, but if you have billions of objects with one byte size, it will take even more time. So, and during this time span, uh, you're already at risk to have another disk failure, right? So to keep this low, you can uh, do something different. You set the weight of this device to zero in the ring. Rebalance the ring and push a new ring. Now, what now happens is that the remaining disks inside your cluster each get one or more new partitions, but only a, f uh, a subset of the partitions. So each of these disks get only a one new partition in the example, and you need only to replicate much less data to the remaining disk, and this is much faster. 
So, and once you have done this, of course, you can add new disks afterward and uh, replicate and distribute the data more equal to your remaining disks. Now, let's have a quick, well, let's, let's think about the durability number I gave you just two minutes before. A chance of one in 10 billion to have data loss because of a disk failure, does that make sense at all? I don't think so. Um, because it's much uh, you the, the chance that you actually have a real disaster, for example, that you lose a complete data center because of fire or, well, maybe an earthquake, a thunderstorm, whatever else, it's much higher. And um, to get to these numbers, you really need to distribute your data across more data centers and as far as possible from each other. And as I said earlier, this is done um, with the concept of regions. So, for example, in this case, where you have two data centers, and the one data center is a little bit smaller, stores only one third of the data, you can actually lose one of the data centers, and you're still able to access your data. You're also still able to write new data to the Swift cluster. And once the second data center comes back online, the data that is now placed, let's assume, in data center number zero, region zero, is replicated to the second data center because Swift now recognizes, okay, these storage nodes are accessible again. This also increases availability. So network outlinks, for example, are quite, well, quite often, a little bit, uh, this is a wrong term, but let's assume you have uh, five hours on, of network outage in a year. That decreases your availability uh, for your Swift cluster, or for your data in the Swift cluster. If you distributed uh, this across multiple data centers, for example, then you have a much better chance to deliver the data to your customers and your users. And um, of course, you may want to well, upgrade your Swift cluster or distribute your Swift cluster now to two data centers or even more. And how do you do this? Florian will tell us. Yeah, thanks, Christian. So I, I will tell you what we did at Cloud, what, uh, in order to take into account uh, what Christian told us about uh, having several data centers. Uh, but just one word about um, about a peculiarity in Swift. Um, it's that uh, Swift um, has a good habit of, of splitting the complex task of, of storing safely your data into two uh, simple tasks because there is um, basically um, two, two steps when configuring a Swift cluster. Uh, first, you've got a standalone tool that is called a Swift Ring Builder that allows you to, to manipulate ring files and, and create them, actually. And so this tool um, has all the, the, the architecture, architecture information of your cluster in, in files that are manipulated by this tool, which are called builders. For instance, it has all the information about the relations between your devices and uh, your, your nodes, your regions, and your zones. And uh, this tool is uh, in charge of smartly assigning uh, the partitions that we told about, uh, we talked about before, um, as um, as far as possible in your cluster. Mm. For instance, an object, uh, the, the different copies of an object will be, if possible, stored on different regions, then on different zones, and then different devices, and uh, also on different nodes, if, if, if it's possible. So this, this tool at the end generates the ring files that can be checked by an operator. They are flat files. And uh, once this is done, these files who store the map of your data can be uploaded to the nodes, to the Swift nodes. And on the other hand, you have the processes running on your Swift cluster that are in charge of ensuring that your data is stored uncorruptedly on at the appropriate location. So, as Christian told earlier, if you want to, to, take in to, to benefit from, from the, the durability of Swift, it's better to separate uh, your data into different clusters. And at, at CloudWatt, we, we have been running a near 100 nodes a cluster in a single data center for, for a few years. And we recently decided to, to split the cluster in, in two regions in order to avoid the, the loss of data because of, uh, of the crash, full crash of a data center, because of a fire, for instance, or a plane crash. 
Um, so in order to do this, we, um, we decided to follow a bunch of guidelines in order to be sure that we, we won't lose any data of our users. And also, we wanted to limit the impact on the performance of the cluster uh, for our users to be able to use our, our service. So in order to ensure that no data is lost, we wanted to be able to move only one replica at a time at each step because we wanted to have uh, an, uh, an operation done in separate, separate steps. So we wanted to be able to, to do the, this operation of adding a new region in small steps, so that if anything goes wrong, it doesn't impact the, the, whole, the whole cluster and all the data. We wanted to be able to check for data corruption during each operation. So in order to, to see if there is any abnormal uh, amount of corruption that appears. And we wanted to be able to check that the location uh, of the data is correct at the end of each step. And we wanted to be able to roll back in case of a failure. And in so the second, second, second aspect is uh, the impact on the performance of the cluster. So we, dis we wanted to, be to, to first um, have an idea of the the load on the cluster according to different days of, of the week and also different time of the day in order to be able to, to do our operation during the, uh, the periods where the load is the lowest. For instance, during the night, we have uh, less users than uh, during the day. And we wanted to be able to assess the, the load that will be incurred by our cluster during our operations. For instance, we wanted to know the, the network bandwidth that would be used for each step. And we wanted to be able to, to do small enough steps so that it fits in time frames where the load our, on our cluster is low from the users. And eventually, we wanted to be able to control on which nodes are uh, accessing our users in order to be able to to have nodes with low weight that our users still access and use, and we have nodes that are uh, stressed by our operations, but users shouldn't go there. So what is nice is that all the, um, the items that are in blue uh, are already implemented in, in Swift for a while. For instance, moving only one replica at a time uh, actually, it's something that uh, is already integrated in Swift Ring Builder, the re rebalance command. Normally, uh, you if, if we do only one rebalance operation at each step, we should only move one copy of each object at a time. So we are sure that two copies of our objects are untouched if something goes wrong. Checking for data corruption is done by, uh, by a process which is called Swift Object Auditor which computes consistently, uh, continuously uh, the, the hash of each object on the nodes. And if the hash is incorrect, compared to the, to, the, to the hash that has been set during the creation of the object, if this hash is incorrect, the object is quarantined and it's considered as deleted, and the object is replaced during the, the replication mechanism uh, of Swift. Then to check for data location, there is a tool uh, which is called Swift Dispersion Report that is uh, shipped with, uh, with Swift. So it allows to, to check the, the percentage of, of your data that are is at the appropriate location. And if you do, for instance, you push a new ring, you can follow the state of, uh, of your cluster. You will see that 80% of the data are at the correct location. And then when you relaunch the tool several hours later, you will see that the percentage of, of uh, object will be increased, for instance, 90%. And uh, running back is something that is made easy by Swift because uh, the, the, Swift, the, the ring files that are uh, copied on the Swift nodes are reloaded automatically by the processes without the need of being restarted. So if, if, you push, if we push new ring files and something goes wrong, we just push the former ring files and the data goes back to the former location. And eventually, to control uh, which Swift nodes are reached by our users, there is a mechanism which is called read and write affinity that we, call we can tune inside the Swift configuration files. 
The, the new thing is that uh, since Swift 2.2, which landed in uh, last month actually, we have two. Uh, we have the the ability to 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 move the data to a new region smoothly, step by step. This wasn't possible uh, before Swift 2.2 actually. So, if I wrap up this. Uh, the thing about adding a new region. So we want to be able to, to smoothly move our data to a new region when we add this new region. And this is really possible since uh, Swift 2.2. In the end, if we want to have at least one copy of each data to the new data center, we, want, uh, we, we must have a total weight of the region of uh, at least of one third. Because actually the, the weight is a mechanism that is used in Swift to uh, to specify to tell Swift the amount of data that we want in a, in a in a region or in a node or in a device. So, as an example, concrete example to add a new region, uh, we can add the new devices or and new nodes to a new region with a very very low weight for each device, so that only one partition is um, is assigned to each device in the new region. And then, with subsequent steps, we can increase the device's weights in the new region by steps of 5%, for instance, in order to move 5% of the, of, the, of the data of the whole cluster to the new region, and so on and so forth. And so we can increase the weight of the new region progressively until we reach one third of, uh, of the total weight of the cluster. So. <coughs> I provide more details about how to compute the weights in order to have uh, a given percentage of, of your data in the new region in, uh, in an article uh, whose link is there. And also I provide some scripts uh, as example in order to, uh, to, be to, to compute these weights. Okay, Christian, uh, I'll let you uh, provide an outlook and summarize. Yeah, this thanks, Flora. You're welcome. So, uh a quick outlook, what's coming up next in Swift and a little bit summary uh, for this talk. So one of the hot topics in the Swift developer community is erasure coding. And the people over at uh, Swift Stack, Intel, and Box are really pushing hard uh, for this feature. And well, it's coming real soon now, um, hopefully. Um, so what's the idea of erasure coding? Uh, erasure coding, the idea is so instead of storing, for example, three replicas of each object, you only store, well, you apply erasure coding to an object. And this means that you split your object in multiple smaller fragments, for example, 14, store these on different disks and nodes and so on. And now you are able to recover, or rebuild uh, an object out of a subset of uh, fragments, for example, 10, if you configure to use a 10 over 14 scheme. So what does it mean? It means that you tolerate a lot of four fragments and you can recover from that. So you have a higher durability of your objects, you can tolerate more losses in your cluster, but the important part is that you only have, well, roughly 40% overhead in this example compared to 200% if you have three replicas, which means that you have a much cheaper cluster, or the operations are much cheaper in your cluster. Um, for the durability calculation, so what I want to do is a more detailed calculation to take into account the number of disks, for example, servers and partitions, and um, add some calculation for erasure coding. And this is also a community effort. We started this, uh, the discussion on this um, about a month ago at the last Swift hackathon. There were people involved from NTT, Coda was involved here, people from uh, Swift Stack, IBM, um, Seagate, Red Hat, well, most of the community. And we want to do an ad hoc session at the end of the week. So if you're interested in this, uh, just drop me a line on by email. And uh, maybe it's even well possible uh, to include a sample calculator in the Swift documentation itself, which would be great, I think. Um, just to wrap up this talk, so uh, what's Swift is giving you very high availability, even if large parts of your clusters are failing. And what I forgot to mention earlier on is using the zone, co zone concept, uh, you also can ensure that, or avoid that you have, um, that you have data lost because of, uh, for example, upgrades of your cluster. 
So if you're upgrading your cluster, for example, let's, let's say a kernel upgrade or a firmware upgrade of your disk controller or whatever else, do it zone by zone. And between each upgrade or between each zone, watch the cluster for a few hours and see if everything works fine. If something is failing then, you can stop your upgrade and, well, remove the zone, whatever you need to do, but your remaining zones are not affected by the upgrade at that mo point in time. The automatic failure correction mechanisms uh, inside Swift also ensure a high durability of your data. So, and depending on your cluster configuration, uh, you can even exceed known industry standards. Well, let's say you have some data that is, well, a billion dollars worth, maybe um, you store it in five different data centers at the same time. If you have the money for it, well, go for it. The latest Swift release, the Juno release, um, as Vaughn told us uh, just a few minutes ago, there's a more smoother and more predictable way to upgrade and enhance your Swift cluster um, by very fine-grained steps when adding new zones or regions. And the storage policies also allow you to give your users more options to store data. So, for example, you don't want to have your complete cluster um, running on four replicas because it's too expensive, but a subset of the data you need for replicas. So provide a storage policy for four replicas and your users can select the storage policy that they need for their data. And Razor coding, finally, it will increase the durability inside your cluster even more while at the same time lowering your operational costs, which is a great feature. And with these words, um, I'm done. So thank you very much for attending the talk, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask now. No questions. <laughs> There's a question. Uh, could you please use a microphone because otherwise people will, oh, <laughs> thanks. So actually I have two questions. Yeah. So the first one um, has to do with um, reducing the weight of a failed drive to zero and then mm -hmm. push the ring back. Yeah. So from your experience, does it make sense? It seems to me like a lot of uh, pushing of rings to do. So does it make sense in large um, deployments where you were two to five percent of the disk are failing? Um, well, from my experience, well, uh, pushing a new ring is a day-to-day -day operation from my perspective because okay. You always have disk failures, um, and from time to time you're upgrading your clusters, you're changing IP addresses of nodes, stuff like that. So um, for the clusters I, I'm aware of and I know, um, most of the time people have some automa automated mechanisms uh, for, operational, for operations like this, so to push a new ring and stuff like that. Um, from my perspective, it's, it's fine to push new rings, um, even if you have a failed device. Okay, so the second one, can you elaborate a little bit more about the new feature in 2.2 that allows you to do the more fine-grained um, controlling the... Yeah, so when so before 2.2, um, when you had, for example, a single region and you added a new region, Swift always tried to very hard to ensure that you have at least one copy in the new region, which actually means if you have a cluster only with a single region before 2.2 and add a new region, one third of the data will actually need to be rebalanced. That's still true that one third of the data needs to be really balanced, but it's only one step and you have no control about the amount of data in a given point of time. With 2.2, let's say you add a new region and you add, let's say, 100 disks in the new region. You set the weight of the disk when you add them and add the new regions to zero. So there's no data movement at that point in time because now the Swift Ring Builder knows, okay, there's not enough weight in the new region to hold all the data. Now you increase the weight of the devices in your new region, for example, to 1% total weight in that region. And Swift will now only move, or the Swift Ring Builder actually, will only move a, a subset of the partitions to the new region, which actually means that you only move a little bit of data and not all the data that needs to be stored in that region at a time. And finally, you need, so in the example before where you have two data centers 
uh, one data center with one third of the data and another data center with two thirds of the data, you need to ensure that the total weight in the regions is two thirds or one third of the total weight in the cluster. So by using the weight parameter for Swift Ring Builder, you are now able to control the data flow much better than before. Yeah, you're welcome. There's another question. So hello, uh, my question about this edit new region, but uh, why you can't just add new region and said, said to Swift what, please Swift, slowly, slowly sync it. Why, uh, why you need to add five persons, 10 persons, if you need about 50 persons at the end? Um, well, it's mainly based on the Swift Ring Builder because the Swift Ring Builder is actually just a small tool that operates on your ring and um, well, of course, we could add more features like, let's say, you, add your, you, you tell your Swift Ring Builder, okay, move some part of the data only without calculating the, the amount of data on yourself. But uh, you need to be in control of which rings are pushed to your cluster, actually. And so it shouldn't be done automatically, I think. Okay. Because... Okay, thank you. Well, Flan, you want to tell? Wanted to tell us? Yes, I have some, uh, just a, a typical case uh, that uh, I think about is uh, if if you, uh, you have a, a petabytes of data and if you move uh, one third of your data in, in one row, it will take several days or weeks maybe to move all your data. And uh, du during this, this, uh, this period, your cluster will be heavily loaded and uh, your users will be impacted. And by, by splitting the, 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 the movement, the operation in, in small steps, we can do this, for instance, with by hundreds of gigabytes per hundred of gigabytes, which will be done during the night, and you won't impact your your users as uh, as much. Uh, maybe we, maybe we can just specify a speed of syncing data. It will be easier, I think. Mm, this is this is an option also, and it has is is uh, yeah it has its pros and cons, and the thing that we wanted to be able to do was also to be able to to roll back if, for instance, at, at a giving step, giving step, given step, sorry, if we have a, a failure or devices that uh, are not good or, or, or part of our network that doesn't work, we want to, to be able to be able to roll back to only one step and not to cancel everything and, and redo it again. So, so if you're limiting the amount of data or the, the replication traffic on the network level, for example, or, or on the storage level, um, this is fine if you add a new region because then you can just say, okay, let's replicate at 10 megabytes a second or whatever else. But the problem at that point is if you have actual failures in your cluster, you want to recover from these failures as fast as possible. So you'd, you would need a concept to split the traffic. So instead of this, let's keep a high number of replication traffic actually and control the data that is moved. For example, if you add new regions or zone, with with the Swift Ring files, yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, when we have fail, if a, a lot amount of disks will fail, and it will I and it this turn on, we have uh, w w very slow speed for uh, for customers. Then when Swift will sync it, so we need to set up speed not only sure. not only on adding replication. Yeah. yeah, sure. But now you have more control points. So if you have yeah, of course, you can set your replication traffic on the backend uh, network. Because now they do, so they do we do the same thing. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Did your durability calculations reflect the probability of losing a specific object or of losing some object in a cluster? Um, specific object? Because if you think about this, uh, let's, let's, let's think about a cluster that stores 10 to the power of 50 billion objects. Um, the probability will, will be one or even uh, bigger than one that you lose objects in, your, in a given year. But um, to compare it to other existing public uh, cloud vendors, they are always um, look at a, into one object. What's the probability to lose this object? The probability that you lose actually one out of your objects in your cluster, the bigger the cluster gets, at one point in time, you have at least one object per year that you will lose, or even more, maybe. But that doesn't mean that the probability for a given object is increasing. It's just 
for the whole, whole set of objects right. in your, inside your cluster. H have you done anything to document or calculate how that probability changes with the number of objects in a cluster? And uh, size not yet. Or, was or was this your N more not disks? Yet, but uh, it's in point. progress, so um, it's something we have in mind uh, for uh, the next uh, steps and to maybe to integrate it into the Swift documentation itself. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Just another quick durability question. I, um, a lot of research has indicated that uh, there's a pretty strong correlation uh, between disk failures, uh, if whether it's manufacturing lots or yep. for, for a number of yep. reasons. And I'm just curious if, if you included those kinds of, of, of risks of um, correlated you know, chain conditions uh, in, in your calculations. Our, our experience is that those are a pretty high impact. And your durability uh, numbers seem a little high. Uh, no, uh, not in this calculation, but um, so from my experience, it's, well, if you create a new Swift cluster from scratch, of course, it's m much likely that you use the same kind of disks on, your, on, all, on all your storage nodes. Um, but if, if you um, create a Swift cluster from time to time and you add new storage node with different kind of disks and stuff like that, of course, you can just uh, start with a Swift cluster that involves different renders to, to lower this problem. Mm. Um, but then at the same time, if you look into publications, for example, from Google or from uh, Backblaze to large storage um, operators, you will see that this number, two to five percent of disk failures per year, is actually quite a good number and a reasonable number in day-to-day in, uh, -to -day operations. This is nothing that um, correlates to the number given by disk vendors. Because disk vendors will sure. give you, for example, a mean time between failures for one million hours. One million hours, so a year has 8,760 hours. It's unlikely that you see the first failure in 100 years. Um, so two to five percent disk failures in a year is, is quite a reasonable number, reasonable number from, from my point of experience. Yeah, I was mainly asking about the risk. Once you've lost another disk, uh, of losing a second disk or yeah. a third disk, yeah. that was it. So one of the things, um, if you lose disks, and in the probability calculation, because it's a simplified model actually, mm -hmm. um, is if you get to a number of, of 10 nines, or even if you get t uh, seven nines maybe in the calculation, is it's unlikely that you have, dis uh, that you have data loss because of an object, uh, b because of a disk failure. It's much more likely that you have some other kind of disaster in your data center, as I said, fire, earthquake, whatever else. Um, so you need to take care of that too. It doesn't make sense to optimize, uh, to only optimize for the disk failures. Um, you need to take into account other failures as well at that point. No, that's, that's clear. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much.